My name is Dominic Ziemke. I'm at a research department at TU Berlin where we focus on uh, transport models and transport simulations. And today I'm going to talk about um, how we use OpenStreetMap to model bicycle traffic in an agent-based simulation. So cycling is a comparatively cheap, fast, healthy, quiet mode of transport that also consumes less land, for example, than other modes of transport. And uh, in light of the societal, environmental and other problems um, associated with motorized traffic, um, cities have been starting to promote cycling as a, yeah, as a mode for everyday uh, transport and increasingly put the mode of cycling into travel plans. For instance, the city of Berlin has just last month passed a much debated big new mobility law that is um, supposed to foster uh, cycling as a mode for everyday uh, transport. Just like other modes of transport, um, also the bicycle needs specific infrastructure, so we know that a train to work well needs a train track. Um, other modes of transport need their infrastructures as well, and also bicycling works much better and smoother if you don't have to squeeze in with other modes of transport, but if you have your dedicated infrastructure. But we are not all fully sure about this. Um, we still need and want to evaluate this and to be able to evaluate transport uh, policies and schemes, a suitable tool is uh, transport planning models. They are state of the art when it comes to motorized um, individual transport and public transport, but not so much when it comes to uh, the mode of cycling. At our department, we are very strongly uh, involved in developing um, a software that is called MATSIM, which stands for Multi-Agent Transport Simulation. Um, it's an open source software implemented in Java, so everybody um, of you, you can just uh, go to GitHub or to, to this link here, which directs you then also to GitHub and download or git clone the software, run it, extend it. Um, yeah. So it's a modular and, as I already implied, extendable software. And uh, s specifically, or specific for MATSIM is that uh, the study region that you simulate uh, in it, each traveler is resolved individually. So each real-world traveler is in this software represented as what we call agent. So it has its individual representation and each such agent has a daily activity travel pattern, which we call plan, which basically says I'm at home or in this case here I'm at the hotel in the morning, then I walk here to the Polytechnico, attend uh, the conference and then maybe afterwards I go to a restaurant and then I go back to the hotel. So this is my day plan for today and this is um, each, such a each agent in our transport simulation has such a day which allows us to run quite specific and disaggregate analyses. But still, um, MADSIM is designed for large-scale scenarios because it's quite simplistic in the way it models traffic on the network. There is no direct vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle interaction. It's a bit simplified. Um, every link in the network is just modeled as a, as a queue, as a first in, first out queue. And this makes this model suitable for larger scenarios, despite being uh, quite detailed uh, on the, in the way um, the travelers are represented. Um, let me quickly ex uh, explain how you how it works. It's an iterative approach. Each iteration consists of three components. First, as I already said, um, every traveler with their individual daily plan is simulated on the network. In doing so, they compete with one another for limited network resources. Um, by that, they di indirectly interact because if there are many other travelers, I, I, I need l more time on my route. Um, when the whole simulation of the day is done, all agents score their plan. 
if they had to spend a lot of time in, in congestion, the score is going to be a bit lower. And if they quite nicely reach the activity that they wanted to attend without any delay, they get a, they get a good score. And in the third stage of the simulation, they are allowed to replan. You as a modeler can choose by which choice dimension you allow them to replan. You can allow them to select other routes, other modes, or change their departure time a little bit. And with their um, adjusted plan, if not in every iteration there has to be adjust adjustment, but if you are, if you are a specific agent that you are looking at, had an adjusted plan in one iteration, they go with this adjusted plan into the traffic simulation of the next iteration, and then this goes on and on and on. And at some point it stabilizes, plans don't change so much, and then we try to validate this status against some real world da data, and if we succeed, we have a base model of our study region that we can then use for policy analyses. And this here is a little example how it then looks like. It's um, a scenario set up by my uh, colleague Amit Agarwal and it's uh, for the city of Patna in India and you can hear, see here um, bicycles and the rectangles are car. They actually travel on the left side because it's India. Then there are some squares. This is trucks you can see that they actually pass one another. This is a comparatively new feature that also my colleague Amit uh, implemented. And yeah, so here you can see how the traffic simulation um, then looks like in reality. And the different colors implies if, if agents can travel with free flow speed more or less, then they are green. If they are a bit more strongly affected by congestion, um, they, they are depicted more in, in reddish colors. Um, as input, you need the daily uh, travel plans. This is a quite complex ta task, which I will skip here, to represent transport demand. And on the supply side, you basically need a network. You can also enrich this by transit schedules if you want to look at uh, public transport simulation additionally. but um, today we can actually stay quite simple here and only look how we uh, create a network. And as our main input data source to create such networks for our transport simulation, we use OpenStreetMap. Um, when creating the network, we pass through OpenStreetMap for ways and nodes. Um, we can optionally decide only to go, say, from, from motorway down to tertiary roads or residential roads, so leave the lower category roads out. Uh, then we create a node if we are at the end of a way or at an intersection, and then between those nodes we create links, and in doing so we look at the max speed tags of OpenStreetMap, or uh, also look at the one-way tags if it's if it's not a one way, we create actually create uh, two links uh, for our MATSIM network because MATSIM always has to be a directed graph and we also estimate the flow capacity based on the highway type and the number of lanes. Um, here at this conference, we actually came with two extensions. Um, the one that I'm talking about here for, for bicycles and another one done by my uh, colleague Teresa, who's also sitting there in the audience and it's, she has a poster uh, which you can uh, look at in, in building five. And now, as I already said, I want to focus on the extension for bicycle traffic. And when it comes to bicycle traffic, it's uh, quite important to realize that people are quite different. They, they can be young, younger or older, male, female, or have um, are heterogeneous in, um, among many other uh, characteristics. But when they travel in a car, actually, um, a lot of this heterogeneity of people does not come into play so much. A bit philosophically, you could say, in terms of travel behavior, a car is some kind of homogenizer uh, for people because when they travel in the car, they really 
want to minimize travel time. Maybe if there is toll or something, there might be some properties unrelated to, to travel time, but mostly they want to reduce travel time. In terms of cycling, however, this whole heterogeneity of people really comes into play. Uh, and this is like the outcome of some literature analysis Simon and I did. Um, travel time still plays a role, obviously, but also route length. Gradients are quite important. A car driver does not, I would argue, probably not, not at all care about gradients. But for cyclists, uh, a steep hill or, um, can, can, be, can quite affect route choice and travel behavior. Comfort plays a role. As a cyclist, you don't uh, want to cycle on, on, on cobblestones. Um, this actually, you can go further down if you travel with a race bike. This is even more relevant compared to traveling by a mountain bike. Uh, for gradients, some studies have uh, found that women actually try to avoid steep hills a bit more than men. Uh, and commuters also behave a bit uh, differently uh, as, as leisure uh, cyclists. So there are, uh, there's a lot of yeah, different things you have to take into account here. Then obviously the bicycle infrastructure, are there lanes or dedicated tracks, intersections? The volume of motorized traffic, this is in particular important if there is no dedicated cycle infrastructure and cyclists have to cycle uh, directly within, the, uh, within other uh, traffic. Uh, parking facilities and some further attributes also play a role. So let me first show you how we adapted MATSIM now. Um, in when the plans, as I uh, explained before, are scored at the end of a simulated day in the model, we now take into account not only travel time and distance, but also infrastructure, comfort, and gradient, and also other uh, interaction with other traffic. But today I want to focus on these three components. Um, the scoring function, um, yeah, basically I already said it. This is how it looks in its default version. And now to model bicycles, we have added this term. This here is about the infrastructure, about the comfort, and about the gradients. And this is the uh, length of a specific uh, link which we are scoring in this, this moment. So let's now focus what adaptions we made here and especially how we uh, inferred the data that we require for this based on OpenStreetMap. So um, if a, a way is a highway and has, uh, in addition, a cycleway lane uh, tag, then it's a bicycle, uh, a main road with a bicycle lane. Um, if it has not the doesn't have the, uh, uh, the lane, value for the cycleway key but the track value, then it's a bike lane on the sidewalk. Or if it's a bicycle track away from the, from the road, from roads, then it's uh, yeah, specified as highway cycleway. There are further attributes and um, I'm not going too much into detail here, but if it's, uh, if it's a smaller road, which we assume to be more pleasant as a route for uh, cyclists. And I, I mean, I shouldn't say assume. It's also what we found in the literature study that we did. Um, the cyclists get a bit higher score for traveling on this infrastructure. And if it's a very big road that doesn't have any dedicated cycling infrastructure, then you get a worse score for traveling on it as a cyclist. Regarding the comfort, there is this nice, nice key smoothness on OpenStreetMap, which is basically perfectly describes what, 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 what we are looking for. It goes from excellent to impassable. Um, the problem is a bit that this key is not used so frequently. So we see here Berlin. Um, there are 5,700 uh, ways in Berlin that have the key smoothness. Um, I think there are about 40,000 um, highways from, from motorway down to, to residential street. And you also see here that it's a bit uh, spatially uneven. So it's, um, yeah, it's not so frequently used. So we decided to uh, fall back to the key surface, which is used almost everywhere. 
um, it has about the same number as, as the highway, as, as, as there are highways in Berlin, so you can very well base uh, our, our scoring for the comfort component of cycling um, on, on this open street map key. However, and this is a photo that we took uh, yesterday here in Milano, um, the surface on the bicycle rail can obviously be different from the one on the, on the road, and here it's actually better. You have here these slabs, I don't know if this is the right word, but here you, for the cycleway you have asphalt, so you see that it's important to take this into account. Uh, in Berlin there are 9,000 um, ways designated as cycleway, taking into account all the, the different uh, combinations, uh, but um, the key cycleway smoothness, so which specifically tells about the smoothness of the cycleway, not about the road in, in general, is very rarely used and uh, the, our fallback surface specifically for cycleways is also not, not so frequently used. Um, then to gradient, um, there is this L for elevation tag on OpenStreetMap, but it's intended for, like for, for little, for hills or mountains, so it's intended to specify a natural peak. It's, and the wiki actually says uh, OpenStreetMap does not try to be a general data elevation database, so it was clear for us that we uh, have to use elevation data from elsewhere. I think I have to speed up a little and this is fine because I didn't want to go in too much details here. There is different types of elevation data, surface, uh, digital surface models and digital terrain models. Surface models basically um, capture everything that is there. So is, if there is a, a tower, you, you will see this, while terrain models basically capture the, the bare ground, what we would be interested in for modeling the slopes of the terrain on which our cyclists travel. Problem is, this is not so frequently available. For Berlin, we found such data. Um, this kind of data, which is not so suitable, is for example, by SRTM available worldwide, but it comes with a downside that it's not so well suited. And what we then do is, in creating our network, we enrich it um, by giving it uh, the elevation as a z-coordinate, uh, and this we can then take into account when our bicyclists travel in, in scoring. Um, yeah, this is a little map of Berlin. In this map that we see here, this is the only real point of elevation, like in terms of terrain. If you look at SRTM, you see quite, I hope it's, uh, is it visible? You can see uh, there's a lot of noise uh, because it's not so exact and you really can't distinct this, this peak here. If you go to um, the terrain model, you I hope it's more or less visible, you can actually see this peak here while there's not so much noise in the rest of the terrain. So this is the data that we use um, to derive information for gradients. Um, other information that we intend to use from OpenStreetMap is there are some monitoring stations tagged. Actually this uh, next to this bridge here in Berlin is a bicycle counting station. And uh, sin since it's sitting uh, directly on, on the way, we can nicely integrate this and use it for validation in our transport model. Um, and the, the data that are, like the, the actual counts data that are uh, attached to this location are also openly available. Um, and as I said before, I mentioned it briefly, um, parking may also, like the type of parking facilities along a road may also affect how um, cyclists perceive uh, the route and th this is in principle also available on OpenStreetMap by this parking key but also not, not so frequently. So to wrap up, OpenStreetMap is a super useful tool for us. Uh, we, we like it a lot and we have been using it a lot and now 
also for the specific task of modeling bicycles. The tags that we could find and identify are, are very good and very suitable and um, yeah, specific enough even for very uh, high resolution uh, bicycle transport modeling. Uh, some of those tags are however not so frequently used. Um, yeah, so I guess this will leave some, uh, some tagging work for us and hopefully also for other people. And yeah, and just like the data that we use are open, also as I said, our software is open to use. So if you want to run it, you can go to madsim.org and under this link actually, actually also run a, a small bicycle simulation example. Okay, that's my talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dominic. Now, I think there are quite some questions, I hope so. Yes, please. Uh, wait a moment. Wait. Have you found out anything interesting about Berlin? Like any congestions or. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about what you found out? We haven't, I have results? to say, we haven't, been, we haven't yet run the simulation for Berlin. So we have a Berlin scenario. That's, by the way, also open source, so if you, if you ever want to do your own transport study, you can just download it and use it. Um, and there we have the demand, like the travel plans for a representation of Berlin, but we have not applied it yet, together with a, with a cycling model. So I, unfortunately, I will have to tell you at some later point if we found any particularities in our model about Berlin. Uh, since you just mentioned it, um, can you tell us more about the, um, the plans? How do you design them, get them? Uh, the, do they come from surveys, um, for, from government data? I mean, how do you know that person one goes from A to B at 7 a.m.? There, there are different, different methods to do this. Uh, there are these household travel surveys which you can use and then by some sampling procedure scale it up to the full population. Um, alternatively, you can collect uh, demographic and socioeconomic data and use an external model. There are these um, activity-based demand generation modules. There are several of it and many researchers work on it so you can build a synthetic population with these information and run them in such a model and then take the output and feed it into Matsum. Um, and colleagues of mine have also been working on um, yeah, big database approaches like looking at mobile phone data or Twitter data. So there are different options. Um, yeah, but as you uh, noticed, Matsum is not itself a demand generation model. It it, it, it requires an initial solution, but then can adapt and react to policies and, yeah. Yeah. Another question? My, my two questions would be, first of all, the, um, are you aware that, the, that uh, you, my example is, for a tag like a food way, that you can have bicycle equals yes, uh, and, and that people are either tagging foodways and allow bicycles, and other people are tagging um, bicycle ways um, and saying f uh, foodway equals yes. So, so you would catch uh, uh, many percent more data if you also allow foodway with bicycle equals yes. We, we actually did this. I, I, I think I missed mentioning it, but we, we did this. So okay. we, that foodways that have a, you know, that specifically allow um, to be used by cyclists are, are included in okay. our cycling network. And then the other tag, the, I mean, elevation is not that tag that much. I mean, but but still more than the the very the uh, 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 very rare um, smoothness. I never heard about smoothness, but the height. Uh, and, um, you are you, you are saying you are uh, taking into account 10 meters as a hill in 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 uh, Berlin. 
So it's, uh, you, you looked for about only, I'm a Swiss, you know, for, because <laughs> a hill for me is like, like one kilometer or something. So, uh, so you are, you're looking for smooth uh, irregularities. So you would need an, a better uh, terrain model or, or, or something. Um, actually, for Berlin, we uh, identified, this is maybe I was a bit fast at that part, we, we found a digital, digital terrain model mm -hmm. uh, where we can really distinguish uh, natural elevations that are, like, that are quite relevant for cycling from, from a tower that only uh, increases the height in the surface model, right? Mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. Which, which you have to regard as an artifact because the cyclist does not go up and down the tower but <laughs> around it. So, um, yeah. For Berlin, we have found such a, suit, a suitable digital terrain model. The problem is only um, that for other locations, and we also kind of want to make our approach transferable and not only be s very specific to a, a certain location, for other locations, such uh, DTMs, digital terrain models, are not, not openly available. That okay. was a bit the problem. And Regarding the ELE or ele elevation tag on OpenStreetMap, the, the wiki really says you should only tag like, uh, what is it called, natural peak, like, mm -hmm. a, like a hill. Or landmarks. You can, if you, if you um, search for it, you can see that uh, sometimes for a regular street intersection, there's also the ELE tag, but I think this is, n yeah, it, sometimes you find it, but uh, if I understand it correctly, this is not are what this L attack is originally in yeah. intended for so far. What so they would have suggested is that to take LIDAR, LIDAR data, um, which is a little bit too much of information, but you could then uh, try to extract the, the street level. This is actually LIDAR data. I, I, yeah. uh, as I said before, I was a bit fast here, but what we uh, just started using for Berlin now is LIDAR data. Oh, nice. So. Thank you. Oh, one last question. Yeah. Just a comment and a question. So in this presentation, like in the previous two presentations, we have seen specific applications of requiring very specific OSM data, either land use in the previous ones. This is uh, bicycle related data. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a project uh, on Berlin, but I think Berlin is a very uh, ideal case in this. It's because everything is really complete in terms of bicycle related mm -hmm. tags. Did you mm, make a survey in other cities in Europe or even outside Europe to see what is the situation in terms of the presence of these tags? Uh, and so um, we, we did not do this uh, systematically, but uh, Simon and I just, uh, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, we, we did some tech info uh, uh, runs for Milan and found that it's it, that it's similar actually to mm -hmm. Berlin so you can't say it in Berlin there is mm -hmm. much much more text regarding uh, these these components that we discussed here so it, that was similar and for we but we didn't check it systematically for other cities okay thank you thank you very much once again thank you